apology. Let me uh, <laughs> go ahead and read the text, and we'll, we'll go ahead and look at it. Okay, so Luke chapter 18, and we're just going to be looking at three verses, verses 15 through 17. Let me go ahead and, and read those. Luke writes, and they were bringing even their babies to him so that he would touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they began rebuking them. But Jesus called for them, saying, Permit the children to come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. Well, may the Lord bless uh, his his word to our understanding. all right, so this morning we were, um, we were looking at uh, the importance of uh, humbling ourselves if we are to be forgiven, if we are to be justified. Remember that Jesus was addressing the Pharisees who saw themselves as righteous and looked down on others. And we know that pride has that effect. You know, the, the more highly we think of ourselves, the, the less we tend to think about others. And so Jesus told them a parable that was really meant to get them to take a good look at themselves. He told them the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee went into the temple to pray, at the same time, basically a tax collector. And while the Pharisee stood to basically to boast about how much better he was than others, especially than the tax collector, the tax collector, overwhelmed with his sin, humbled himself and cried out to the Lord for his mercy. And Jesus said, that man went to his house justified. And justified is really what it's all about when it comes to salvation. He was forgiven. He was righteous, declared righteous in the sight of God. He was accepted by God while the other was not. And our Lord was reminding us that when we compare ourselves with each other, especially to those that we don't believe are as good as we are, and we can all do that because of the sin still in in us, Uh, we can also end up thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. But when we compare ourselves with the right standards, which is God's law, or the one who kept that law perfectly, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we see how far short we fall, then we know that really all we can do, all of us, all we can do is cry out to God for His mercy and for His forgiveness. And when we humble ourselves and we call out to God, that's when the Lord will hear us. Remember, we need that kind of faith to come to Him initially, but we also need that kind of faith and humility to continue to seek the Lord for the things that, that we do need. Now we move on to a different situation where we see some Jewish parents who presumably believe that Jesus is the Messiah uh, bringing their babies to him in order that he might touch them. Now, the disciples, we see, tried to stop them, thinking that this was an unnecessary distraction for Jesus. But Jesus rebukes them and calls for them to be brought, saying the kingdom of heaven belongs to them or belongs to such as these. He then goes on to say that there's a sense in which we must all become like children if we are to enter the kingdom of God. Now, this evening, we we do want to consider what it is that he is actually saying. So let's dive right in, shall we? (laughs) First, we see the parents bringing their children to Jesus. And I think, obviously, the they in this passage, even though they're not identified, must mean either one or both of the parents of these children. And these parents must have believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Otherwise, they wouldn't be bringing their children to Jesus, really, for, um, you know, for the purposes in which they were bringing. And what they were bringing their children to Jesus for was that he might touch them. Okay? Now, Matthew fills that idea out a bit by saying that they brought them to Jesus, that he might lay his hands on them and pray for them. We read in Matthew 19, verse 13, Then some children were brought to him so that he might lay his hands on them and pray. Uh, These parents wanted what all parents want for their children, at least what they want if they understand what's, what's really most important, not that they become doctors and lawyers or the president of the United States, but that they receive God's blessing. 
that all would be well for them, and I think particularly the blessings which God had promised uh, to Israel. Now, one thing I think we need to note here, and, and I think this is, this is going to be perhaps the, one of the most important things we're going to look at, is how Luke describes these children. Now, we have three accounts of, of parents bringing their children to the Lord Jesus through um, you know, the, the three synoptic gospels. I don't think we have this in John, but we do see it in Matthew and in Mark. And Matthew and Mark use a different word than Luke uses. The word they use refers to a child that ranges in age from infancy to a child that is still under the age of puberty. Once they reach puberty, basically that's where they go through their bar mitzvah, their bat mitzvah, that's where they're considered adults in the eyes of the Lord and no longer children. So it's referring to any age child, at least the word that Matthew and Mark are using. But Luke uses a word here that, that means a child that is either unborn, which means that, uh, here's another interesting point, that uh, even an unborn child is considered a child, according to God's word, which shouldn't surprise us as believers. But from an unborn child to one who is still a nursing babe, okay, which means that these were infants, and that's why the, the word here is translated by our translators. They were bringing even their babies to him. Now, I think that becomes important when we try to understand in what sense the kingdom of heaven could belong to babies because Jesus says the kingdom belongs to such as these. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. But notice the parents ran into a problem as they were bringing their children to Jesus for this uh, particular blessing that they desired from him. When the disciples saw it, they began rebuking them. And I think in the context, that means that they were scolding them. You know, don't bother Jesus. Uh, he's too busy for your children. He's got more important things to do. After all, I mean, he was on his way to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover, which was going to be the last feast that he was going to celebrate on earth. And it was going to be at this particular feast that he would be betrayed, handed over to the Romans and would lay down his life for them. Jesus is too busy. Don't bother him with, with these children. But Jesus' response caught them by surprise. Instead of agreeing with them, he told them to let them come. And then he adds this in verse 16, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Now, this, this is what we I need to spend a little bit of time trying to understand. What is it that Jesus was referring to here? Now, there are a couple of things, or at least two things, that can get in our way of understanding what, what he means. And I think the first is the phrase, to such as these. You know, this is often understood to mean that the kingdom belongs to those who have a childlike faith, right? Like these children that are being brought to Jesus. Now, we certainly, I think, would be tempted uh, to believe that if we were reading Matthew and, and, uh, and Mark because of the word that's used. But the problem with this view here is that these children were too young to have really any kind of faith because they were still, at this time, babies or, or infants. Now again, uh, Matthew and Mark use a word that refers to children that could range anywhere from inf infancy to just under puberty, but that's not what, um, what Luke does. You see, the temptation here could be to see that these children uh, basically in an age of relative innocence. When, when they're, uh, I don't want to use the word gullible, you know, because um, that, that's not a kind word to use for children, but uh, when they're very young, we know that children tend to trust and believe what their parents tell them with a simple childlike trust, right? And those who would take this view would say that Jesus was blessing these children because he saw them as an example of what must be true of everyone who would enter into the kingdom of heaven. They must have a childlike faith. But then the question would rise, why does Jesus actually lay his hands on them and bless them and pray for them? If they're merely examples of what one ought to be if they're to enter into the kingdom of heaven and his reference was not actually to those children themselves, why was he blessing them as mere examples. But again, let's not forget that these were babies and they couldn't even really have that kind of example at that particular age. 
So then another question arises, how do we reconcile what Matthew and Mark are saying with what Luke is saying here? Why do they use one word, but Luke uses another word to describe the same situation? Well, I think the only way that these two accounts can be reconciled is to understand that these two words that are used here actually overlap. Because you know, Matthew and Mark are using a word that refers from infancy to just under puberty, while Luke is using a word that in this context could only refer to in, you know, absolute infancy, babies, right? But there is overlap between those two terms, and the, the overlapping meaning would have to be these children were babies. They were infants. Now, if Jesus wasn't pointing to the kind of faith that these particular babies had as an example of those who would enter into the kingdom, when he says the kingdom belongs to such as these, what else could he possibly mean? Well, there are a couple of other possible interpretations. The first one, uh, if we just considered this passage in and of itself and didn't look at the rest of the Bible, we could possibly conclude that Jesus was saying that these children were actually saved, you know, that the kingdom of heaven belongs to them, not just the typological kingdom of Israel because they're children of Abraham, but the spiritual kingdom that Jesus came to bring because that is what he was referring to when he said this by virtue of the fact that they are the children of the covenant. Remember what God said to Abraham in Genesis 17, verse 7. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Now, one might be tempted to think, that their salvation is sewn up, but it can't mean that they would automatically inherit God's kingdom by virtue of the fact that they were Jews. It cannot mean that because the Lord clearly tells us in other parts of Scripture that no one can receive or enter into the kingdom of heaven without the faith that they need, the faith that the new birth actually brings. Remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water, which I believe is the word, and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You're, you are not born into the kingdom by virtue of your first birth. You have to be born again by the word and the spirit. And we also don't have to look very far in the Old Testament or even in the New Testament to, to see that most of Abraham's children did not believe and they rejected the Lord Jesus. In the Old Testament, they rejected the Messiah who was coming when they rejected God's purpose for them and did not believe. But of course, in the New Testament, it becomes much more clear, doesn't it, when, when Jesus comes into the world and he comes to his own and his own do not receive him. Paul reminds us in Romans 9, verse 27, that that was going to be the case. Even as far back as Isaiah, he says, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. I, I don't think you can get any clearer than that. Not all of Abraham's children, obviously, are going to be saved. So that's not what Jesus means when he says the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. So what does Jesus mean? Well, I think what he's saying here is that God's kingdom belongs to these infants by way of promise. Remember what we read earlier from the same chapter of the book of Romans in our meditation, Romans 9, verses 3 through 5, where Paul talks about the great privileges that the Jews enjoyed. He says, For I could wish that I myself were a curse, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who were Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises. Whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh who is overall God blessed forever? You know, one of the, the privileges of being a Jew is the fact that you had the word of God. God was in relationship with you and he made several promises, right? Through, uh, not only through the promises themselves, but also through prophecies and through uh, the types and the shadows. He sent the Messiah to them, that this was their Savior, their Messiah. It was their covenant that God had made with them, and Jesus was coming to fulfill it and to bring 
the spiritual kingdom of God, that actually belonged to them by way of promise. The fact that God's promises were made to the Jews is the reason why Peter said to them on the day of Pentecost this in Acts 2, verses 38 through 39. He said, you know, when, when he preached about the fact they, they had crucified and, and had their Messiah murdered and how God's wrath was going to come against them, he said, when they said, what should we do? He said, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. He says, the promise pertains to you and to your children. Because, again, I will be a God to you and to your seed. But it also pertained to the Gentiles that the Lord was going to call into the kingdom of God. Now, I think the promise he was referring to here was the promise of the Holy Spirit, which had just been poured out on the day of Pentecost which is really the blessing that Jesus came to give the Jews and to give all who believed. And remember, those who were filled with the the Spirit on the day of Pentecost were Jews. Uh, That's what the heirs of the kingdom were to receive. That's what it means to be saved, to have the Spirit of God. But they must first repent and believe in order to receive that promise. But they can only do that by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit if they were to become the heirs of the of that kingdom. But the point again is that that was the fulfillment of God's promise to Israel, the promise to them and to their children that he would send the Messiah and the Messiah would give them the Holy Spirit. And so Peter says to them, repent, which means not just turn from your sins, but turn from your sins and trust in Jesus and you will receive this this promise of the Holy Spirit that, that God had made to you and to your children as well as to those he would call. Now, Jesus then wanted the parents to bring their children that he might lay his hands on them and pray because they were the heirs of his promises. The kingdom belonged to them by way of promise, but they would not inherit it unless they repented and believed. Now, it's interesting that they're still represented in the same relationship with God Uh, Even after the Jews rejected Jesus and crucified him, God was still being faithful to his promise to Israel to be a God to them and to their children. So it it wasn't just pre-crucifixion and rejection of Jesus, but it was also post, even while they were still enemies of the church. I think this is one of the most interesting verses in Scripture in Romans 11, verses 28 and 29. Paul writes this, From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies. The Jews are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So essentially, even though the Jews had had rejected Jesus and handed him over to crucifixion, yet God still had to do with them because they were the children of God of Abraham, even though they were the physical children of Abraham, the promises still pertain to them, but they would not receive them unless they repented and trusted in Jesus. It's an interesting kind of attention that's there, but it's, but it's still here. So again, the point is, how did the kingdom belong to these children? Well, it didn't actually belong to them because they hadn't repented and believed, but it belonged to them in the sense that it was promised to them as God had made these promises to Israel. They were the children of Abraham still, not spiritually yet, and maybe never, but physically, and God had made his covenant to them. Now, the question we need to ask here is this. Does this have any relevance or application uh, today for us and, and for our children? It's interesting that in the Old Covenant, you know, you don't have many examples of this, but you do have some of those who are Gentiles joining themselves to Israel, right, uh, such as Rahab the harlot, uh, who, um, well, Rahab actually is the word used for Egypt. Maybe she was an Egyptian, but she was certainly a Canaanite, right, and she lived in Jericho. Or Ruth the Moabitess, who joined themselves to Israel 
And when they did, they became full participants in the covenant that God had made with Israel because they were now of the same faith as Israel. They were not the same ethnicity. You know, they, they didn't become children of Abraham physically, uh, but they did become Jews. I don't know if you realize this, but the word Jew does not refer to a nationality. The word Jew refers to a faith. They were of the Jewish faith. When they join themselves with God's people, God's promises then belong to them, like it did to the rest of the Jews, but also to their children. As, as it, we see that, I don't think there's any question that that's the way it is in the Old Covenant. Do you know that Rahab was the mother of, or became the mother of Boaz? And Boaz is the one who married Ruth and uh, became the, the mother of Obed, who was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David, to whom God's promises applied, right? So being joined to the covenant, being joined to the covenant God had made with, with the, the seed of Abraham, the, the physical seed, they became full participants in that covenant and those promises also then applied to their children. Now one thing we, we sometimes miss with regard to the, the covenant that we're in today is that it's the same covenant that God made with Abraham. Now, we understand that, that the book of Hebrews talks about the contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant and how the Old Covenant is abolished, but that's referring to the Mosaic Covenant. When you look at the, all the descriptions and the comparisons in that book, it's not talking about the Abrahamic Covenant. The Old Covenant was actually added to the Abrahamic Covenant to teach the Jews of their need of the seed of Abraham who was to come. It was the tutor the teacher that leads them to Christ, right, points out their sin, shows them the consequences of their sins through all the sacrifices taking place uh, within the, the temple. But the Abrahamic covenant was never abolished. The Abraham covenant or Abrahamic covenant was actually fulfilled. He is, Jesus is the seed of Abraham, and he is the one who becomes the blessing uh, to all the nations of the earth. This covenant that we're in is the Abrahamic covenant in its fulfillment. Now, Paul represents that covenant as a tree in Romans chapter 11 in which the natural branches have been broken off. Those are the Jews who were a part of that covenant but were broken off because of their unbelief. And we as Gentiles have been grafted in because we have believed and received uh, the seed of Abraham, uh, the Messiah. Paul writes in Romans 11 verses 17 through 18, but if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partakers with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember it, that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. So whatever it is that Israel had, okay, was represented by that tree, the blessings of God that come from the root and the tree with all the branches are the participants, in that covenant, the Jews were broken off because they did not receive their Messiah, but the Gentiles who did receive him were grafted in. Now, being connected to this tree, to this covenant, means that essentially everything that God has promised to Israel uh, has become ours. You know, we are participants in basically the rich root of the olive tree. We are getting that, that nourishment, that blessing that God has uh, for us in the new covenant which he had meant for Israel. It, that includes, I believe, the relationship that we're looking at. And I think that makes sense of what Peter says to the Jews in Acts 2, verse 39, when he says the promise is for you and your children. I believe he means the same to those who will be uh, the children of God that he gathers in from those who are far off, all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself, the Gentiles. So even though there were fewer Gentiles being added to Israel back in the, the days of the Old Covenant and, and you know, especially the Abrahamic Covenant, in the New Covenant, we see many more. You know, we see the blessing uh, that was meant for the Jews basically being sent out throughout the world and being preached so that whosoever will would come and be joined to the people of Israel. And that's why I believe that having now the same relationship in the same covenant that God people, uh, God's people had in, in, in the old, you know, before Jesus came, would still continue today, that that same 
blessing would continue, that God would be a God to us and to our seed. And I think that's why Paul tells the Gentile church at Corinth, again, here's one of those other passages, right, that their children are holy. And holy means they belong to God. It means that God is in a relationship with them. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14 The unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband, for otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. And what does that mean? These children are holy. It it can only mean one thing. It means that they are God's. Everything that is holy belongs to him. Everything that is holy is separated from the unclean to God himself, whether it be objects, vessels, or whether it be people. Now, what I think Paul is saying here is this, that even if we should be married to an unbeliever who is unclean, the fact that we are believers is enough for God to consider our children to be holy. And the sanctification of the husband in this case cannot mean that he's saved, obviously. You're not saved through marriage any more than children are saved by being born into covenant households or or becoming children of believers. But it means that his unbelief, his lack of holiness, his unholiness, his uncleanness does not affect the holiness of the child. We still have to come to grips with the fact that this child is called holy. And holy does not mean uh, not illegitimate. And unclean does not mean illegitimate. Uh, That's not the term Paul used. He could have very easily used that term. But he used the word holy. And holy really has only one meaning. It means that this child belongs to God. Now, again, the question is, and this is what we need to avoid, Does that mean that our children are saved because they're holy? No, of course not. Does it mean they're ever going to be saved? Well, we we like to believe that. We do believe God is gracious and merciful in in, the, the, the line of descendants of his people, but it doesn't guarantee that they are going to be saved any more than it meant that the Jews would all be saved because they were the children of Abraham. You know, if you really stop and think about it, if all the children of believers were saved, the whole human race would be saved right now because we are all children of Adam and Eve who believed, right? God redeemed them. So why isn't the whole human race saved? It's because not all the children, sadly, are going to be saved. They will only be saved if they believe. But on the other hand, it does mean that God will deal with our children. I think, as he dealt with the children of Abraham, even though they weren't believing. You know, God was still faithful to them, wasn't he? Uh, He brought foreign armies against them to chasten them when they went astray. He blessed them when, when they obeyed. And I think the Lord will do the same for ours. He will bless them for their obedience, and he will discipline them when they don't obey. He will be faithful, even though they are not faithful. And I, I say that just to, that to give us some hope because, you know, many of us here have children that are not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the question is, can we draw any hope from this passage that the Lord may yet deal with them? I think we can, that God is, is still going to be faithful to them even though they are not faithful to him. Still no guarantee that they're going to be saved. But I, I would rather have him dealing with them than, than not, wouldn't you, right? Now, Jesus concludes with with this statement in verse 17. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. Now, we might be tempted, I think, here to use what Jesus says to revert back to the idea that when Jesus pointed to these babies and said the kingdom of God belongs to such as these, that he was talking about the need of a childlike faith to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, we already saw that babies can't have any kind of faith or really be any kind of an example. All they can do basically is is sit there and where you put them or cry out for food and so forth. I don't think we see them as an example of what Jesus is talking about because he was laying his hands and blessing and praying for infants. But I do believe that that is what he means here, okay? Uh, He uses here the word that Matthew and Mark used, a word that refers to anywhere from infancy to under, just under puberty. And that is where we see the qualities in children. You know, that belief and that trust in parents. 
that Jesus says must be in us if we are to enter the kingdom of heaven. We have to have that kind of trust, an implicit trust that what we're being told is the absolute truth and that basically our parents are going to take care of us and protect us and do all that they promised. I think really that's the only thing that Jesus could have in mind when he points to a child as an example of what we need to be to enter into the kingdom of heaven. What else could a child do? You know, children do not come into this world loving God, do they? You know, sometimes there, there's, again, this idea that up until the time they know the difference between good and evil, that they're essentially good. They're innocent, right? And, and that, you know, um, then they do good things, but that doesn't describe the children God gave to me, right? <laughs> and it doesn't describe me as a child either. I didn't do the things that were right automatically, although I did trust my parents. I did believe what they told me. I looked up to them, and I, you know, I, I idolized them in many ways. I, I had an implicit trust in them. Children don't come into the world loving God, but they come into the world like everybody else, hating God. You know, it doesn't mean they hate their parents, but it means they have no disposition towards him. Paul reminds us in Romans 8, verse 7, and this is true of children as well as adults, the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God, and that's the way children come into the world. They don't come into the world with the Spirit of God in their hearts. They come into the world as flesh. So Jesus can't be pointing to children as examples of saving faith because they don't have saving faith. But what he is saying is that if we are to come to him, we must come as children with the kind of trust that a child has in his parents. And you know, the Lord tells us that's the kind of faith that we need to continue to have in him, to trust him in that way. If I were to ask you, how do you view your relationship with God? Do you see him as a peer? <laughs> no, I hope not. You know, do you, do you see him as, as king? Yes, we should see him as king, but what else is he? He's, he's father, right? He's our father, and we are his children. Don't you sense that kind of relationship with him? And don't you have in your faith that kind of trust that a child has for a father? You know, God is your heavenly father, and you are his child, and, and that's the kind of relationship we have. So again, when we ask the question this evening, to whom does the kingdom uh, of heaven belong? It belongs to us if we have received Jesus with a childlike faith and are trusting God as, as his children. And it belongs to our children, but only by way of promise. They still need to repent. They still need to believe if they're going to enter into the kingdom. But we do need to remember they still have a really a blessed, I think, status or position with the Lord. It is a blessing to have these promises and to have a God who is working in their lives. I hope you see God working. I mean, even though it may not be exactly what we'd like to see, we know that God is still working in their lives, and it's a blessing to know that he is to graciously teach them their need of him. That is a great blessing, and it's one I believe that the Lord has given to us. Well, let's, um, let's bow for a moment of prayer, and um, in our prayers, let's again pray for our children that the Lord might work in their lives, be merciful to them.